Now, now, Paul mentioned this earlier. What, what is the deal? What the hell is? Is there anything really Corinthian leather? Is that anything? It, it just, <laughs> it's just, it, it's some kind of vinyl they make in Detroit, isn't it? <laughs> No, they found, they found a leather that was very pliable, very soft, and very durable. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I don't know whether it was because of uh, the, the writer, Jim Nichols, who wrote the commercials for Chrysler for me at that time, found, he wanted to find a, a word that sounded sort of elegant, that mm -hmm. I could say with a little verb, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so, Corinthian. Oh, yeah. Seen, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> But, but does it mean uh, anything? Nothing. Yeah. Cordoba is a city located in southern Spain, with a surprisingly interesting history. A small Roman settlement in the 8th century, Cordoba would eventually evolve into a premier center for education and learning. By the 10th century, Cordoba was the second largest city in Europe. In modern times, this region of southern Spain is most associated with exotic beauty and brave bullfighters. This romanticism of the region was particularly evident during the 1970s. Many were desperate to seek refuge from a grim reality of fuel shortages and ever-increasing personal and economic uncertainty. The swinging 60s had given way to unexpected challenges. Not since wartime had access to energy and other basic necessities become so scarce. Many folks wandered around with a sense of malaise, daydreaming of simpler times of ages past. Some in the U.S. auto industry realized this was an opportunity to offer products that would evoke images of exotic, faraway places to entice worry prospects. With raw horsepower regulated out of existence by the mid-70s, Automakers turned to a theme of personal luxury in various flavors of Old World Baroque. One of Chrysler's earliest efforts to introduce such exotic imagery was a trim package available on the 1970 Newports that was christened Cordoba. Aztec was the theme for this earliest of Cordobas, featuring side moldings of a quote, Aztec theme, as well as padded roof material the brochure listed as Espanol vinyl. This one-year-only trim package proved mildly popular, paving the way for a legend. The desire to escape the realities of difficult times has always been strong, just as compelling as finding the perfect chariot for such an adventure. The Chrysler Cordoba was introduced in the U.S. for the 1975 model year. It was christened as the new small Chrysler, and indeed Cordoba was 12 inches shorter than its corporate offerings. As with most in the auto industry, Chrysler was in a bit of a panic to downsize, but money was incredibly tight as was usually the case for the struggling brand. But prestige was still important to 70s customers. You wouldn't want to take a family to stake an L in something anything less than elegant. So Cordoba was infused with a sense of class. One of Cordoba's legendary styling details is the medallion that could be found in the hood ornament and multiple other locations inside and out. Oddly, the origins of this medallion are actually Argentinian, but this was typical of the 1970s automotive styling era, which featured a mishmash of old world European influence Sometimes accurate, sometimes not so much. Regardless of the authenticity of the details, there was no denying the sense of genuine luxury that Cordoba offered, particularly when well equipped. From highly sculptured bodywork to rich interior detailing, Cordoba would quickly become desired for the elegance it provided. Interiors featured rich wood tone trim with filigree scroll detailing, and of course, there was the optional rich Corinthian leather. Though targeted as a higher end offering, Chrysler was careful to provide many features as optional, so those on a budget could still afford Cordoba. A 360 V8 and automatic torque flight transmission were standard, as was a 25 and a half gallon fuel tank, which provided a decent driving range, so long as you could find the gas to fill it with. And of course, this was the 70s, so half of the 20 exterior colors were a shade of brown. 
Cordoba. The accent is on the first syllable. Cordoba. 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 Da, da, da. Cordoba. Now, Cordoba. So now when I, I said, I said, a new car, when I was reading the demonstration for them, I said, Cordoba. And they said, no, 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 it's Cordoba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is? Yeah, they're telling you. Cordoba. Yeah, right. But not only, not only co Cordoba. So I said, well, at least let me say Cordoba. And they did. Yeah. It was clear by 1976 that Cordoba was a certified phenomenon for Chrysler. With over 150,000 units sold, Cordoba had contributed greatly to the continued existence of the troubled brand. Styling was little change, which makes sense. After all, the highly sculptured front end with formal chrome grille played a major role in Cordoba's success. This was a look that proved irresistible to many flower-powered children of the 60s. It was a look that was distinctive, a break from the dull and ordinary. Cordoba was also practical. Though downsized, a wheelbase of 115 inches did provide enough room for real adults to ride in comfort in the rear seats. Cordoba's combination of style and value was easily marketable, and sales increased to 165,000 units for its second year of production. By 1977, Cordoba's optional Corinthian leather had become the stuff of legend. Though it was really only a marketing term, Corinthian leather did evoke visions of grand adventures of long ago resulting in many more Cordoba cells for Chrysler. As the 70s drew to a close, the mood had lightened ever so slightly. The flower children movement of the 60s slowly transformed into the equally groovy disco party of the 70s. Cordoba evolved to match the changing times. Interior and exterior fabrics and colors were revised. Instrument panels remained simple and straightforward, with a focus on the driver for most major and minor controls. Though there were a number of warning lights, Cordoba did offer a fair amount of actual gauges, though probably not enough to satisfy John Davis. The 400 cubic inch Chrysler V8 was standard now, while an optional 318 2 valve was also available for those that wanted to save a little on fuel costs. In only three short years, Cordoba was a true winner for Chrysler, with a style and sophistication that truly stood out from the polyester clad crowd. Cordoba would undergo a major front-end transformation for 1978 with the federal legalization of the new rectangular sealed beam headlamps. Unfortunately, the seemingly minor facelift would trigger the twilight of Cordoba. Rivals for GM and Ford would debut offerings with all too similar front ends and with arguably better build quality. Chrysler would continue to offer interiors that were among the most luxurious of the American brands, but build quality did suffer, and sales would start to slow. Many also viewed the stacked rectangular headlamps as less elegant than the original round design. Though the hood and front end remained heavily sculpted, somehow the magic just wasn't there like it used to be. Interiors were little changed from before. Economy, however, was slightly improved with the addition of a lock-up torque converter for the automatic transmission. Rear installing carried on with a distinctive design that distinguished Cordoba from a slew of corporate cousins. As before, the array of interior and exterior options was impressive. From CB radios to multiple vinyl roof options, Cordoba offered a level of customization that has drifted off into the mists of distant memory. Inside, it is a shame that the rush to install the latest headlamp technology did trigger the beginning of the end for Cordoba. Another example of seemingly minor revisions causing unforeseen consequences that played a major role in the demise of something that started out so right. The rectangular headlamps did remain for 1979, but the grille was slightly altered, as were other minor details, in an attempt to regain some of the original Cordoba magic. Revised heating and steering wheel selections provided a sportier look, particularly when combined with the T-roof option. 
opera lights, as well as the now famous medallion hood ornament, and deluxe wheel covers continued on for the 1979 model year. New two-tone paint treatments also helped distract from the controversial stacked headlamp design. Corinthian leather remained on offer in fetching shades of red, gray, midnight blue, till, green, and cashmere. It is interesting to note that Chrysler also introduced a heritage offering in the form of the Chrysler 300. The 300 was a historic nameplate for Chrysler, though it did little to bolster sales in this mildly rebadged form. The 300 exterior differed from its near-twin Cordoba primarily by featuring unique grille treatment and body-colored trim. By the twilight years of the 1970s, Cordoba could celebrate with the knowledge that it had accomplished something truly special. Once again, securing the continued existence of Chrysler. Cordoba was entirely new for 1980, and entirely unrecognizable from the shape that it made it famous. A move to Chrysler's J platform reduced overall length and width considerably. The new crisp tailored lines disguise the fact that Cordoba was now a derivative of the ancient Volare. Lee Iacocca's transition from Ford to Chrysler during this time is evident in the sharp angles and overall appearance of the second gen Cordoba. There were now two trim levels on offer, Cordoba and Cordoba Crown, the latter of which featured additional luxury touches such as a padded Landau roof and premier wheel covers. And yes, Corinthian leather seating surfaces were still listed on the list of numerous options. Multiple option packages, in fact, such as a light package and Corinthian edition package simplified ordering a personalized second generation Cordoba. Chrysler's venerable 3.7 slant 6 with torque flight automatic was the standard powertrain for 1980. 5.2 and 5.9 liter powertrains were also on offer, for those looking to have just a little more swagger in the long journey to 55 miles per hour. The 70s and 80s automotive era was a time of fantasy by necessity. Ever-increasing regulations and insurance costs forced the transformation to personal luxury from raw horsepower and raw excitement. The second generation Cordoba exemplified this movement and has been largely forgotten today. Cordoba for 1981 continued with a theme of sharp angled styling that did successfully disguise its ancient platform. The Cordoba LS featured a more aero front end that was surprisingly distinctive from the standard Cordoba. Both Cordobas featured luxurious interiors that did rival the best of the U.S. offerings. An extensive list of electronic installing options continued the tradition of the original Cordoba. A revised sport handling package featured heavy-duty sway bars, shock absorbers and torsion bars, and springs as well as wider wheels and tires. By 1982, cells were but a small fraction of Cordoba's glory days. The car that had paved Chrysler's way to the 80s was nearing its twilight. These images help recall a Cordoba that is largely lost to the fuzzy distant memories of time the cars that eccentric great aunts and uncles may have chosen. The Cordoba LS, in particular with its coach roof and 300S grille, seem to now exist only in brochure form. It is for this very reason that I respect this second generation of Cordoba just as much as the first. Though not as well known or as successful, it is incredible to see what Chrysler accomplished with such an archaic platform on a shoestring budget. Cordoba's final year was 1983. Having successfully served its mission, the once proud nameplate would drift off into the ether with little fanfare.
few cars evoke memories like Cordoba. These are the cars that relatives purchased to be different, that our older siblings drove during high school. A reminder of simpler times. Maybe not better times, but a time that takes us back to our roots. For some, our earliest memories. Cordoba also represents a rare occurrence where a U.S. automaker dared to be different, to embrace a heritage of the unfamiliar, yet fascinating culture. Sure, the jaded modern sensibility may view these efforts as nothing more than trite marketing, but there is no denying. These are the intangible things that bring the magic, the magic that is Cordoba. But if we're honest, Cordoba would not have been the success it was if it were not for one key personality, a force, a persona, that would completely alter the course of Cordoba and all of Chrysler, and send rivals Ford and GM scrambling to the drawing boards. It is the style, grace, and distinguished elegance of Ricardo Montalban that captured the heart of a nation. Cordoba was a runaway success during its initial introduction, and it likely could have sold even more units if it were not for the stiff competition that was introduced by Chrysler itself. Mostly lost to history is the vast array of near clones that Chrysler quickly rushed to market in the hopes of cashing in on an unexpected hit. The B-body platform of the mid to late 70s kind of served as a place where historic nameplates rode off into the sunset. Body and interior styling changes offered by Dodge and Plymouth were little change from Cordoba. This both saved cost and helped retain a visual connection to the more upscale offering. And while it is a little sad to see the once historic performance icons such as Roadrunner devolve into simple tape and stripe packages, it is fascinating to look back on these variations on a single theme. Nameplates such as Charger carried over the sculpted hood and header panel, causing a bit of cannibalization to Cordoba cells. But Chrysler had little capital to spend on expensive bodywork, so grille variations and sportier wheel and trim packages served as a major differentiation from Cordoba. The B-body would evolve into the early 80s in interesting ways, such as the Dodge Magnum XE, which featured aero front end work and unique character lines along its fenders and door panels. The T-roof and multiple shades of brown interior choices remained on offer right on through to the very end. Dodge and Plymouth also offered variants of the second generation of Cordoba based on Chrysler's J-Body platform. The Dodge Murata featured the crisp styling favored by Chrysler's new president, the Iacocca, and successfully obscured an ancient platform in Lincoln-esque clothing. Luxurious interior options attempted to make up for rapidly aging dashboard and door panels that were expensive to redesign. All Chrysler brochures continued to attempt to convince the buying public that quality really was a priority. The ultimate Cordoba sibling arrived on the same J-Body platform per 1981, the return of Imperial. But that's a story for another time.
find a, a word that sounded sort of elegant that mm -hmm. I could say with a little verb, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so Corinthian. Oh, yeah. Seemed, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> but, but does it mean uh, anything? Mm -hmm, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Is that that? Uh, well, what does, you know, what does David Letterman mean? You know, well, it's, <laughs> it's a name, baby. It's a name. It's a name. But it, it doesn't refer to a geographic area. Out of curiosity.